Thank you. Dear colleagues, this is the third lecture of this semester of Onomastics Online. And as you know, one of the main purposes of this series is to emphasize the, the interdisciplinary nature of dealing with names. And that's why we had speakers from the fields of critical geography, spatial cognition, and even second language learning and teaching. Now we will approach names from the perspective, uh, from the approach of uh, cognitive linguistics. And after Carol's fascinating uh, presentation on metaphorical and metonymical names, Today's speakers are going to talk about the metaphorical and metonymical use of proclonyms. And I am very happy to welcome our speakers, Rita Brdar Sabu and Mario Brdar. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And I am also glad to welcome the chair of this event, Alina Bugesiu, former secretary of ICOS. So the floor is yours. I wish a wonderful time for us, Alina. Thank you, Katalin, for this wonderful introduction. I will just uh, mention a few words about our speakers, and then I will give them the floor for the actual presentation. Uh, Professor Rita Burdar Sabo works in the Institute of Germanic Studies at Petrus Lorand University in Budapest. She is head of the Intercultural Linguistics Program at uh, this university, and she does research in cognitive linguistics, contrastive linguistics, intercultural li linguistics, as well as morphology and pragmatics. Her current uh, projects are focused on the theory of metonymy as well as on figurative language across cultures. Professor Mario Berdar is uh, a professor of English uh, linguistics in the Department of English Language and Linguistics at the University of Osik, Croatia, and is also a full member of the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts in the Department of Philological Sciences. His main research interests include the fields of syntax, word formation, and lexical semantics. And his publications mostly deal with contrastive and functional co and cognitive approach to grammatical constructions, cognitive processes such as met metonymy and uh, metaphor, as well as lexical relationships and the lexicographical description of uh, English. Uh, Professor uh, Rita Bridar Sabo and Professor Mario Bridar, the Virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alina, for this kind introduction. And hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everybody, depending where you are joining us from. First of all, we would like to thank Katalin and Aikos for inviting us, and also for the wonderful initiative to organize this lecture series. We are very much honored and delighted to be here. And uh, now I'm going to share our screen. I hope Check. it works. Okay, we we'll go back, back, back. Yeah. So they have seen everything backwards. Right. <laughs> no, this is the title. And uh, you can see the title of our presentation, Anthroponymy from the Cognitive Linguistic Point of View, More Metaphor and Metonymy Than Meets the Eye. As is well known, names of people may, under certain circumstances, turn into appellative or common nouns, that is, they may become acronyms. In the majority of cases, we witness the development of a more generic sense in addition to the retention of the parallel proper name status, though the latter may even become backgrounded or obscured, as for example, in the case of diesel. There is, however, also a process that goes in the opposite direction, that is appellative or common nouns may become proper names. This is onymization, more specifically, anthroponymization. This often happens in the case of names denoting professions that come to be used as family names. For example, English family names such as Smith or Potter, German family names such as Metzger, Butcher, Fischer, or Müller, Miller in English or Hungarian family names such as Sabo, Taylor, that's my name too, or Molnar, Miller. Or in the case of family names deriving from animal names, for example, Wolf, or adjectives denoting certain properties, wide, short, and so on. 
In both cases, metonymy obviously plays an important role. Metaphor is believed to be at work in examples like every once in a while there comes along a player who is described as the new Pele or Messi or the next Zidane or Maradona. Sorry, Rita. Uh, there is a problem with the PowerPoint. Yes. It seems there is a problem. It's not moving or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The slides aren't changing. Yeah. Okay, oh. then, then uh, stop sharing. we will stop sharing. Thank you for telling this. And now we will yeah. try once right. again. Just a second. Uh, what are two PowerPoints are open? Uh, go to the slide number one. And now. Share. Share. This one. And now we have to put it into presentation mm -hmm. mode. Right. And now let's. Is it moving now? Is it moving now? Yes. Good. Yes. yes. So, right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, so I think this yes, was the. Do. Yes. This is where we no. are. Number. So this is the structure of our talk. We show on several case studies that metonymy is present even in what we do not do not see as figurative use of personal names. Then metonymy in personal names often operates over several tiers or levels interacting with other metonymies. Metonymy involving personal names can be complex in other ways. These are the metaleptic cases. And finally, we will come to figurative shifts found in personal names. Uh, these figurative shifts may also involve a metaphorical stage or stages in some cases, but this normally depends on the interaction with metonymies. Now, before we start with discussing these, we briefly define metonymy and introduce its main types. So we are moving to metonymic issues, to definitional issues. In an important paper on metonymy, Barcelona 2012, provides evidence that metonymy is more than just a lexical phenomenon, that is, he demonstrates its role in conceptualization, phonology, grammar, and discourse pragmatic inferencing. In short, metonymy is ubiquitous, is a ubiquitous conceptual mechanism, an inferential schema operating under the lexicon in phonological categorization and in the meaning and grammatical behavior of certain morphemes in the lexicon and above the lexicon, motivating other grammatical phenomena, especially grammatical recategorization and partially guiding discourse pragmatic inferencing especially in direct speech acts and implicatures. And this is the reference. As is well known, in spite of the fact that the whole volume was devoted to the problem of defining metonymy, this is a volume edited by Bences, Barcelona and Ruiz de Mendoza, 2011, defining metonymy cognitive linguistics toward a consensus view, it's the title, we are still far from a consensus view. As Barcelona 2011 stresses, the fact that there is something most researchers would agree to call a standard cognitive linguistic notion of conceptual metonymy that contains core elements of the cognitive view of metonymy, it's by no means a completely uniform notion as there is some disagreement among these authors over a, a number of issues. Metonymy is traditionally approached as a figure of speech of a Stanford type that is, unlike metaphor, not based on similarity, but on contiguity or proximity. Contiguity is taken in a broader sense to cover all associative relations except similarity. This means that metonyms are expressions that are used instead of some other expressions because the latter are associated with or suggested by the former. Cognitive linguistics, on the other hand, takes it to be a figure of thought, just like metaphor. It's often said to provide mental access to a conceptual entity by means of an other conceptual entity within the same idealized cognitive model, as stressed by Kovacs and Raden, 1998. 
for Biervatron at 2013, metonymy is a cognitive process in which one conceptual entity, the vehicle, provides mental access to another conceptual entity, the target associated with him within the same integrated conceptualization. And this is the reference to Biervatronek. By frequently stressing uh, the conceptual nature, conceptual uh, status and nature of metonymy in order to mark how the contemporary cognitive linguistic approach differs from the traditional one, researchers have succeeded in obscuring the formal basis of metonymy, that is in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. What is more, by overplaying its conceptual nature, they opened Pandora's box for an unconstrained use of the notion. There are, however, other serious problems at more specific levels of such an approach. When discussing how this mental access is made possible, most researchers talk about parts and whole and the conceptual mappings from a part of an ICM, an idealized cognitive model to the whole ICM, or from the whole ICM to one of its parts, or from one part of an ICM to another part of the same ICM, that would be a part for part metonymy, producing three most general types of metonymies. We have pointed out on a number of, a number of times the inadequacy of accounting for metonymy in terms of mappings, actually a single mapping, and the problems with assuming part for part metonymies. We therefore propose a slightly different definition of metonymy that does not depend on mappings and only provides for part for whole and whole for part metonymies, but not for part for part metonymies, as elaborated in Brudar Sabo Brudar 2002. This is the reference. Targeting metonymic targets is the title of the article. Metonymy is for us a conceptual elaboration based on the part for part whole relationship that is started by the use of an expression or metonymic vehicle associated with a certain conceptual content or metonymic source within a conceptual domain so that the activation of the source conceptual content triggers the opening up of a mental space linked to it. This is the metonymic target by means of reduction or expansion guided by the discourse context in which the metonymic vehicle occurs. According to Fouconi and Turner, figurative human thought is constituted by the manipulation of mental or conceptual spaces. These are small conceptual packets locally organized for purposes of online cognitive action and can but need necessarily not be identical with domains or ICMs. There is no need to postulate any mappings. In line with our proposal, we can slightly modify the formula for metonymy current in cognitive linguistics, A for B, implying that concept A stands for concept B, replacing four with two, at two B as in Brudar Brudar Savo Impress. This would imply that concept A expands or reduces to concept B, Two can also be replaced by mathematical symbols more and less for reduction and expansion respectively. What goes on in the case of using a metonym of the whole for part type can be visualized as follows. So, uh, it means that metonymy takes place within a single domain at the conceptual level, but that it must somehow be materially manifested or be manifestable in a communicational channel in order to be recognized as such. The only manifest element is the one associated with the metonymic source concept. If you understand metonymy in this way, we are able to explain in a very natural way a number of facts observed in recent research. Our approach can easily account for the fact that the metonymic source and vehicle as a unit are not necessarily permanently affected, that is, that polysemy is not an automatic consequence of metonymy. Another advantage of this approach is that we can account for dynamic construction of meaning 
in running this course. Now uh, we are going to focus on metonymies operating inconspicuously on some garden variety personal names. Let us first imagine that you temporarily have problems with your sight, that your eyes are sensitive to light and that therefore you cannot use your computer or watch TV. Let us also imagine that you are a sports fan at the, and that a great sports event takes place at that time. For example, the European Football Championship oh, no. or Soon. the World Soon. Cup. Soon. <laughs> yeah. Soon. And this means that while your eyes are being treated, you are not able to watch any football games. A possible solution to the problem is to listen to a live radio broadcast or to turn on the TV, turn your armchair, 180 degrees, close your eyes and listen to the audio of the TV broadcast. And there are, of course, huge differences between a live radio and a TV commentary with respect to the amount of information as is made clear by the following examples. The first is a short excerpt from the BBC radio broadcast of the CS semi-final between Liverpool and Barcelona in 2019. Sergio Roberto and wins the corner. Him. He took him right to the byline and then off his knees wins a corner kick. Very clever player. He knows that. He's standing in front of him. He's blocking him. Oh, it's a corner! It's a reggae! Liverpool for Barcelona now! And Liverpool, they were produced the greatest European comeback ever. The greatest European comeback. The second one is an even shorter excerpt from a TV broadcast of the World Cup match between Croatia and Argentina in 2018. First, only the audio without the picture. So this was the audio without the picture, and now let's watch the TV broadcast. Let us now explain why we have played these examples, although it seems at first sight that they do not have anything to do with metonymies. It's conspicuous how frequently the family names of players can be heard in the TV broadcast in comparison with other spoken texts, Brozovic, Kramaric, Brozovic, Modric, the presumption being that most of the rest can be seen anyway. So the viewer needs most help with identifying the players and information on the background and possibly on anything going on on site, but not visible in the broadcast. The second file with the sound of the TV broadcast, but without the picture, puts the recipient in a special position. In order to make some sense of it, he must use his or her imagination and metonymically infer what may possibly be going on. There is obviously far less need for metonymic inferencing while listening to a radio broadcast, although the above metonymy is very important. While watching a TV broadcast, we see the position of the player his activity, running, walking, standing, jumping, tackling an opponent, kicking the ball, and so on. So that practically the only metonymy activated is the one mentioned above. For somewhat less extreme or extraordinary examples of inconspicuous metonymies, we may consider how surnames alternate with prosoponyms, full names in a running discourse. For example, or examples uh, come from biographic articles in encyclopedias. And we now take a look at the specific case of the prosoponym Henry Ford versus the surname Ford. We are not concerned here with the metonymically linked uses of Ford discussed in Van Langendonck and Van der Velde 2016. In the specific case of Henry Ford, 
The names may be used when talking about the family. For example, William Ford, Henry Ford, Edsel Ford, Henry Ford II, Edsel Ford II, Henry Ford III, Calvin Ford, and so on. But when the discourse focuses on the company founder, just Ford may be used, as for example, happens in the Wikipedia article on Henry Ford, in which the section on his early life begins as follows. The corresponding article in Encyclopedia Britannica is also very similar. Henry Ford was born July 30, 1863, on a farm in Springwell Township, Michigan, and so on, so on. And Henry Ford's siblings were Margaret Ford, Jane Ford, William Ford, and Robert Ford. This is followed by some experts, uh, which we, uh, in which we note a switch from the prosoponym to the surname, it's family identified by pronouns or appellative phrases specifying the family function. Ford finished eighth grade at the one room school, Springwell's Middle School. He never attended high school, he later took a bookkeeping course at a commercial school, and so on. Ford dismantled and reassembled the timepieces of friends and neighbors dozens of times, gaining the reputation of a watch repairman. At 20, Ford walked four miles to the Episcopal Church every Sunday, and then Ford was devastated when his mother died in 1876. Strictly speaking, such use of just a family name to refer to a particular person with that family name in a text may also count as metonymy. This is a generic for specific metonymy. And now Mario is going to take over, please. Thank you. Uh, another area in which metonymy plays an important role is naming in sign languages. Uh, there are several strategies for the creation of personal name signs. Some of these are illustrated in this drawing. And they are summarized in the paper by Petita and her co-authors. Co uh, first, we have finger spelling, which is very useful for short names. Secondly, we have initialization, that is finger spelling, just the initial letter of the name. Then we may have literal translation. For example, an appellative is anthropomized into name, for example, Baker. Uh, fourthly, borrowing a signed lexical item that links a historical, famous, or traditional figure to an individual who shares the same name, or names can be based on a characteristic, appearance, skill, role, and so on. Or the last possibility is to combine any of these strategies from one to five. Now, strategy number three, translation, is clearly based on metonymy prior to the translation. And more or less the same can be said for four, and particularly five is metonymy itself. Now, we can take a look at some examples of signs for famous people that are apparently based on the metonymy property for a person exhibiting this property or a characteristic action or habit for a person performing or exhibiting it. So the characteristic may be shown iconically as for example, in the case of uh, Van Gogh's uh, cutting off uh, his ear or in the case of Trump's hair being uh, blown by the air or in the case of uh, uh, Richard Nixon, it's a combination of his initial N and of course the sign, the usual uh, conventional sign for lie in American sign language. I think it's quite obvious why he's associated with the lies. Uh, and here we have two signs from the article by uh, Burston from a Swedish sign language. The first is the sign for Elvis Presley which is based, of course, on his uh, sideburns. And the other is for the sign for Charlie Chapman depicting the twirling of the cane, which is characteristic of uh, Charlie Chaplin. Now consider signs for uh, Hitler in various sign languages. So we have um, in American sign language, then in uh, uh, Spanish, British, the second. That's a British, British sorry, British, British sign language. British sign language. Then uh, Spanish, Spanish, Spanish sign, sign language. language. Icelandic. 
sign language? An Austrian. Or Austria. Austria. No, it was the Iceland. The next yeah. one is the Austrian. Austrian and finally Croatian uh, sign language. So we see that they are all based either on both the moustache and the greeting or with just uh, one of them. Now we turn to some complex metonymies in personal names. We show here that many metonymies that are found in personal names are complex, such that the target of one feeds into another serving as its source and so on. Now, this is a phenomenon that is massively present in spoken and or written languages too. And of course, in sign languages. Some cognitive linguists talk about uh, metonymic chains in uh, these cases, but since we restrict the use of this term to just linearly ordered metonymies in a text, we talk about successive metonymic layers or tiers and such complexes are for us paradigmatically cumulative uh, metonymies. Here we have part of our typology of uh, metonymies. Uh, complex metonymies can be syntagmatically cumulative metonymies. These are actually uh, these chains. These are instances of several uh, metonymies repeated uh, in the text as it unfolds. And we can have paradigmatically cumulative metonymies. They can be diachronic or synchronic. In the cases of diachronic cumulative metonymies, they're also called serial metonymies, for example, by Brigitte Nerlich and her uh, collaborators. We have metonymies that are now opaque because uh, speakers are not just uh, uh, unable to uh, reconstruct the individual state. They are they're actually unaware of the fact that there is just more than just the beginning at the end. And in the case of synchronic cumulative uh, metonymies, we have these tiers or la layers that can be uh, reconstructed, that can be made uh, obvious to language uh, users. Uh, we're not moving now. It's not moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so is it okay now? Can you see it? Okay. It's the moving. simplest, uh, the simplest case of a cumulative metonymy is when two metonymies are superimposed on each other, such that the target concept of one is uh, simultaneously the source concept for the other. So the target of the second metonymy can, in turn, function as the source for another metonymy, and so on recursively. Uh, we can say that these various metonymies are telescoped into each other. And this label is particularly apt in view of what language users see or hear. Just the first source leading to the last target because metonymic inferences are so quick and inconspicuous. Now, complex lexical metonymies of the synchronic cumulative type are really rampant in both spoken and written and sign languages. Some examples have already been introduced in this presentation without making it clear that they are complex in their nature. So the sign for Hitler can be also used to refer metonymically to uh, the group, to the concept of Nazi party. First, we have American Sign Language for Nazi, which is uh, finger spelt, so no metonymy here. But here, <coughs> it's clearly the same sign that is used uh, to refer to the party, which is a group of people. Uh, according to uh, Wilcox and his collaborators, uh, this sign is further extended in Catalan sign language to mean bad or evil in general. Uh, in the same article, Wilcox and his uh, co-authors also discussed the Catalan sign language sign for Charlie Chaplin. We've already seen the Swedish sign language sign, but in Catalan sign language, this is a compound that iconically depicts Chaplin's moustache and the movement of holding the cane and moving it in circles as Chaplin did, thus relying on a physical characteristic for person, in this case, two characteristics in one metonymy. So the sign is also used to mean person moving fast, 
which is a further extension of the first metonymy to a more abstract characteristic of person for general quality metonymy. Similarly, the Catalan sign language sign depicting a characteristic moustache stands for Salvador Dali. And this sign is further metonymically extended in Catalan sign language to mean crazy. A further set of uh, interesting examples for complex metonymies in names, again, comes from Spanish. Now, names of uh, various prizes are based in Spanish on names or nicknames of people. For example, Premio Miguel de Cervantes, Liter Literary Award, and we have all kinds of Premios Goya, which are film awards, and they can be colloquially referred to in the clip form, El Cervantes, Los Goya. Now, the prize for the top goal scorer in one session of La Liga, awarded by the sports newspaper Marca, is Trofeo Pichichi. And it's named after Rafael Pichichi Moreno Aranzade, as you can see here, a forward who played for Athletic Bilbao in the 1910s and the 1920s. Um, it's said that uh, he was nicknamed Pichichi, which is a Basque word for minimum Pichichi, because he, as a child, he was playing football much older, bigger uh, boys. Now, the eponym is clearly metonymic, not just because it means uh, Pichichi minimum in Basque, but here the nickname of the person stands for the prize that honors the memory of him. However, in another, uh, sorry, in another metonymic leap or tier, the label is applied to the player who has received the prize. Now this year it's Karim Benzema. So he is Pichichi de la Liga 21-22. And he can be referred to in the text as El Pichichi. And here at the bottom of uh, the slide, we see that uh, the term Pichichi can also be used in the plural Pichichis Madridistas. And here we have a list of all the prize winners in the history of Real Madrid. Uh, I think 14 of them or something like this, never mind. Um, the situation is similar with other prizes like the Yashin Trophy for the best goalkeeper after Russian goalkeeper Lev Yashin and the Copa Trophy for the best footballer under 21 after French football, Ram, footballer Raymond Copa who played I think for Real Madrid. And here we have uh, part of uh, news uh, that appeared some four weeks ago, I think. And here we have uh, the winners of the two prizes, Courtois, Thibaut Courtois and Gavi from Barcelona. It says Serran, El Yashin, El Copa, y El Copa. So they will be uh, Yashin and uh, El Copa. And we also know that even competitions can be used to stand for the prize or the title and also uh, stand for the team who won it. Here we have the example, El Madrid as la champions. It doesn't mean simply uh, Real Madrid are the champions. No, it means that because champions here refers to the Champions League. So as uh, the full form would be El Madrid as la Champions League. So they are the winners of the Champions uh, League here. And now we have some metaleptic metonymies that are associated. Sorry, that's going back. No. No, sorry. Um, we have seen that um, the uh, Charlie Chaplin sign is metonymically evoked, evoked in the Catalan sign language by two simultaneous metonymic vehicles or sources, the moustache and the action of moving the cane in a circle of fashion. The opposite situation is also possible. Two concepts can function as metonymic targets of a single metonymic source or vehicle one at a time or simultaneously, both of them, as we show somewhat later for diesel. In both cases, we have what may be considered a two-pronged metonymy, but which we argue are metonymic complexes consisting of two parallel metonymies sharing either the source or the target, like this. Now, cases like diesel are, for us, instantiations of the metaleptic type of metonymy. Metalepsis is sometimes considered to be a subtype of metonymy, just like synecdoche, 
often treated as a poorly understood rhetoric rag bag of a sort, including multiple, that is staked the tiered metonymies, and even what it's considered to be run of the mill metonymies like effect for cause. Metalepsis is defined sometimes as a figure of speech in which an expression makes indirect reference to another figure of speech, or as a figure of speech consisting in the substitution by metonymy of one figurative sense for another. Cummings describes metalepsis as a process of transition, doubling, or ellipsis in figuration, or replacing a figure with another figure, and of missing out the figure in between in order to create a figure that stretches the sense or which fetches things, things from far off. Now, this would uh, actually evoke the idea that we have shown before, which we refer to by telescoped uh, metonymies. But we don't understand metalepsis like this, because in narratology, following uh, Gérald Genette, metalepsis is a transgression of the boundaries between narrative levels or logically distinct worlds. And we take metaleptic metonymy to be a bundle of two or more metonymies that make possible transgression between different targets, possibly belonging to different logical worlds. Now, let us see how this works in the case of the eponym diesel. As we know, diesel engine was invented by Rudolf Diesel, a German engineer after whom it was, of course, named. And the expression is often abbreviated to diesel, which is an eponym based on metonymy, inventor, or the invention. Now, as far as English is concerned, the eponym is primarily used to refer to the engine, but also in a further metonymic step to a vehicle, either car or railway engine with that type of engine. The term diesel is also used to refer to the type of fuel that these engines use, but it's not clear how this relates to the rest, because it's a historical fact. This type of fuel was produced much later the original diesel engines running on other types of fuels. So um, it must be probably the best solution or most logical to associate the fuel sense with the engine and not so much with the inventor, which means that we have two metonymies forking off from the engine sense. So from B to C and from D, B to D. And now we return to our Pichichi examples uh, because we show some more metonymies and metaphors. So actually this expression can be further elaborated to obtain some additional figurative meanings. First of all, uh, believe it or not, it can be generalized so as to apply to the top goal scorer of any club during a particular season. That is every football club has its own Pichichi. As for example here, Espanol from Barcelona has Verdú. Leaving football, um, we see that the term can be used in other sports in the sense of top scorer. As for example here, um, and the Panco El Pichichi de la ICB, that's a basketball league in Spain. So this means that it has started moving towards a metaphor-like expression. And a metaphorical layer is clearly present when the target domain has uh, nothing to do with sports, as narrowly defined, which will be shown in a couple of seconds. Uh, in such cases, Pichichi seems to be used as a paradigm in the sense of best of, which according to George Lakoff, uh, is a metonymic, a type of metonymic uh, model. Now, let's see some more examples of metaphorical uses. Now, this guy is called El Pichichi de los Rios, Pichichi of the Rivers, and he is uh, the best uh, angler, particularly uh, catching salmon, right? In Asturia, which is a county in Sp uh, Spain. Here we have a guy who collects autographs. He has tens of thousands of photo, uh, autographs of famous people. So he's called El Pichichi of autographs. <coughs> Sorry. And here we have an architect um, 
who developed more than 650 projects, Lu Luis Gutierrez Soto, and he's called El Pichichi de los Arquitectos. But um, the twist is that actually he played in his youth, played football, and was even part of the first team at Real Madrid because he scored many goals for the club's second team. He was nicknamed Pichichi. So he's Pichichi in two senses. Um, as pointed out in our paper in 2007, the axiological notions best of and worst of as the most problematic in the Paragon model arise in another metonymic tier due to the imposition of a scalar model developed by Michael Israel. The scalar model allows the metonymic mappings of the type whole scale for upper or lower end of the scale as discussed in Rudden and Kovacic, whereby the property is interpreted as being exhibited to the maximum, either in the positive or in the negative sense. The expression can also be used as its own paragon. For example, uh, here we have a footballer, Telmo Thara, who won the Pichichi prize for six times. And he is uh, the absolute uh, recorder here. So uh, he is Pichichi of Pichichis. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Jorge Mendes, who is called El Pichichi de los uh, Fichajes. Uh, so he is the Pichichi of uh, transfer arrangements. He is an agent, football agent. And he has arranged a large number of uh, transfers, be transfers be between clubs. And we can also have um, uh, top scorers scoring from penalty kicks. So here, Cristiano Ronaldo is called El Pichichi de los Once Metros. He is the Pichichi of penalty kicks. And um, a defender may also be famous for uh, scoring goals. For example, uh, Sergio Ramos uh, has been referred to as El Pichichi de los Defensas. So he is Pichichi among uh, defenders. So by way of conclusion, now we have seen the previous talk in the series that metonymy plays an important role in the birth of names. And today we have shown that metonymy and metaphor are also important in their lives, perhaps secret lives, as well as for their death and their afterlife when they surface as eponyms. So we hope to have shown that metonymy is present even in what we do not immediately recognize as figurative use of personal names. So that's part of their secret life. Metonymy in personal names often operates over several tiers or levels interacting with other metonymies. And it can be complex in several ways. And finally, figurative shifts found in personal names may also involve a metaphorical stage or even several stages, normally in interaction with metonymous. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful and inspiring presentation. If there are any questions, comments, or appreciations from the audience. Shall we all show this? I think yes. Well, I certainly found this uh, a fascinating lecture. Uh, it develops the idea of autonomy uh, uh, in a very systematic way. Uh, uh, I like it very much. Uh, when I use the word figurative language, I use it in a far more general sense than you, than you do. Uh, so I, I really applaud this presentation. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I have, uh, <laughs> uh, I've just never gone that far at, at all uh, and, uh, that you have. Uh, it, it's really a, a fascinating subject. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyone else?
<coughs> Any questions or comments, perhaps? It's been such a complex talk that you have covered much of our questions uh, with answers in the second part of your talk. So, um, Well, I, I might add, uh, you know, as I work through uh, the way in which Shakespeare invents names, which is, you know, my uh, current uh, subject matter, uh, what this lecture has shown is, uh, you know, a, a lot more detail that I could use. Uh, I, I simply use the concept of analogy uh, uh, kind of indiscriminately, I guess, uh, compared to what we see here today. Uh, but it can be taken much further and can be uh, elaborated in uh, the way it's shown today. Uh, so uh, I can use today's lecture, I'm sure. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <clears throat> Now, this is Joe Stoltman in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I enjoyed your lecture very much. I think the passion which the two of you demonstrated in your topic was amazing. <laughs> and I, I'm relatively new to uh, toponyms and, and toponymic issues, but my goodness, uh, the research that you demonstrated today and the depth of research was truly amazing. I, I just want to congratulate both of you on one, the research you put into it, the time and effort for the research, and second, the passion in which you delivered it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank well, you, thank uh, you the so truth much. is that we we enjoy what we do. Okay, uh, we are also very new to the uh, onomastic issues, but of course we spent uh, well, shall we say, more than twenty years researching metaphor and metonymy, particularly metonymy. And recently, for a year or so, we have also been uh, dealing with the sign languages, which we also find a very fascinating topic. So we enjoy ourselves. <laughs> I think one of the words Grant used really struck me as well, that the systematic, I mean, th this is what makes onomastics as science, isn't it? The International Council of Onomastic Science. Um, it's going about things in such a systematic way. And I think you've set out an absolute model today for, for how to approach um, a, a topic like this. Th thank you so much for a really interesting paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> so we tried to collect really all types of examples for PGG. So we oh. tested our hypotheses and then we tried to find uh, the examples <laughs> from authentic texts. And uh, it shows that uh, at least one of us is uh, a great football fan, right? Guess who? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Edward. Well, as far as uh, sports is concerned, I, I like what you said about, you know, the verbal or oral presentations of uh, the uh, football game. But I, as a child, I uh, was very interested in baseball mm -hmm. uh, here, here in America. And uh, the only way to have access to the baseball game was uh, audio uh, descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can remember so many very uh, dramatic events in the history of baseball uh, being relayed to me and the way in which I imagined, therefore, uh, uh, the event. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I think you have really captured something there, and it, it, it rings true to me from my personal experience as a child listening to the uh, descriptions uh, over the radio of baseball games. Uh, Bobby Thompson's famous home run when the Giants mm -hmm. beat 
beat the Dodgers. <laughs> and that, that was a big deal when I was a small boy, of course. Uh, and I thought that I did indeed uh, visualize mm -hmm. uh, that event uh, from the audio description. Uh, uh, and then, of course, later on, uh, there were films of it. And uh, I cannot now in my memory distinguish mm -hmm. between the visualization that I had as a child and the uh, pictures or the movie presentations that I saw of the event later on. Mm -hmm. uh, because that image, you know, becomes fused. And I'm wondering, you know, now uh, how fused it is and how can I uh, possibly analyze or separate uh, the audio memory from the mm -hmm. uh, the visual memory that I have. <coughs> yeah, you, maybe you can think about that a little bit and explain yes. it to me. <laughs> oh. Such a fascinating yeah. question. So, so interesting, this problem. Yeah. Really, it's very, very interesting. It's, it's, it's yes. similar to, for example, cooking uh, a foreign dish. And you only know the ingredients, so you have the description of how you should do it, but you have actually never tasted it. You don't know how it's supposed to flavor. So you may have cooked it for, I don't know, 100 times and then you go to that country and taste it. And it turns out that it's completely different or perhaps the same or similar. I mean, that's, that's an analogy, okay? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but... Uh... There must be a way, some way that we, or I would suggest that you can analyze it. Uh, you know, sorting out the uh, the uh, you know the audio description from my visual uh, description that I now have in my head. Uh, um, maybe I can suggest that as a project for you. You know, but of course, yeah, uh, I can't possibly uh, distinguish it now. Uh, 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 anyway, it, uh, that's a, a fascinating subject. Right. Yeah, right. Yes, yes, yes. It's really fascinating. <laughs> Katalin, please. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Uh, I think uh, my son would also enjoy this paper because of the examples, the, the <laughs> full <laughs> examples. But I also have a question. Is there a tendency in how we use these names? So um, is metonymical use of names uh, more frequent when we are referring to negative or positive things, or it isn't important at all? Do you have any uh, findings on this issue? So using names instead of a negative, negative uh, things or using names for positive uh, things or even neutral things, which is the more frequent? Um, uh, well, we, we haven't concentrated here on uh, naming proper. Uh, we more concentrated on the afterlife of uh, names and, and apparently paragons are used in, in a very positive or mm -hmm. in a very negative uh, sense, so in, in this case. And uh, eponyms uh, should be, I should say, as, as uh, parts of terminology, they should be uh, objective, but they're not always uh, like that. They can be also positive or, <clears throat> sorry, or negative too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Could I follow up on that question? Uh, uh, here in the United States, we have a political phenomenon known as uh, well, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump is very uh, famous for uh, calling people names. Uh, most recently, he referred to uh, his uh, competitor in Florida as Ron the Sanctimonious. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but that's just one of hundreds of uh, insulting names, basically. Uh, but uh, so all of them are, uh, well, interesting topics as to how they catch on or not. The uh, sanctimonious uh, invention 
uh, has not caught on very much. And people are laughing at the, uh, um, well, at Donald Trump, the, the maker of the name, uh, rather than at the uh, target of the invention. Uh, but, so, but who knows, perhaps if, if uh, Ron uh, makes impact, so perhaps he will become relevant and then people will recall this. Who knows? <laughs> well, who, yeah, yes, who knows? But uh, it raises the question, of course, as uh, what catches on uh, or not. Uh, <clears throat> now, Charlie Chaplin's swirling of the cane, of course, uh, is something that catches on. It's is something that is associated with uh, the character <laughs> uh, or the actor. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I just think of uh, Donald Trump's, uh, uh, you know, inventions are kind of interesting uh, and, and have been uh, successful. Uh, certainly when he was first running in uh, 2016, he uh, really devastated his Republican opponents uh, in the primaries uh, by just gross insulting uh, names that he gave them. He, he wasn't polite at all. Yeah. So uh, may I come back to Katalin's question? So I think that irony, for example, ironic usage of names would be also a very interesting research topic yeah, sure. and also euphemisms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there are research gaps in, in all these fields. So yes. From the perspective mm -hmm. of onomastics. Yes, and not just uh, considering um, anthroponyms, but also place names, because in a lot of cases, place names yeah. is also, uh, are also used in this way, referring to or Olympic Games or uh, maybe, I don't know, I just have an impact that maybe uh, they are used more frequently to referring to more positive events or, or uh, things, but I don't know. <clears throat> Uh, it's it's really an interesting question. Well, it's well, that we... issue of what catches on that Grant mentioned that, that's actually absolutely fundamental to name studies, isn't it? Because there are so <laughs> many different potential names that could be used, mm -hmm. either for people or for places or whatever, and, and yet oh, somehow yeah. one veterant mm -hmm. catches on and, and becomes the name. And it's isolating that it's examining that and seeing the patterns in that that's that that's just so fundamental to 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 what we what we do yeah, as, perhaps as well. back to what Katon has just said we did some research a couple of years ago and we came up with a model of friends and foes uh, uh, when uh, people for example journalists when they use names of capitals uh, so a, a, a Hungarian journalist uh, We'll have no problem referring to Berlin, to London, to Paris, but with Budapest, that's more difficult. So people somehow tend to avoid mentioning their own capital. And for example, Croatian journalists would avoid uh, mentioning Zagreb. So they would say something else. They would refer to the, the building where the government is or something like this. Uh, so um, it's, it's if you're too close, to the authority, you don't call it by the name of the capital in which it is situated. Okay, so and interesting thing we considered uh, uh, we we studied German examples, German corpora, <clears throat> when Germany was divided, and uh, in the East German uh, press there were numerous references to Bonn, but not Berlin, and after the demolition of the wall, then things returned to Berlin and there were no mentions of Berlin. And because uh, East Germany was uh, friends with uh, uh, Arabs, uh, they also used Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in this negative sense. And when the wall disappeared, uh, the part that the, the, the newspapers that survived uh, in the eastern part of Germany uh, did not mention uh, Tel Aviv any longer because it, it became a sort of taboo. 
So it's it's very interesting. And there was also a difference in the usage of Moscow and and yeah, all Moscow, of Moscow, this yeah. uh, socialist it, capitals. It was a taboo. Really interesting. Thank you. An example for negative usage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If um, there are any other comments or uh, questions, if not, um, I would like to thank you again for the wonderful uh, talk, and I would like to thank everyone for the questions, comments, and appreciations, uh, uh, and for the answers you've provided. Uh, Katalin, uh, I'll give you the floor for the final uh, words. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Welcome. And and also uh, that you uh, give uh, some details uh, or, or talk about the details of, of your new research. Rita mentioned that it is a, a new uh, topic. Okay, uh, so, and uh, and also thank you for the reference for uh, the names in sign languages. Uh, maybe you know that our speakers in January uh, will talk about the proper names in Brazilian city sign language. So you gave a good yes. basis uh, for this lecture as well. And, and finally, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, our next speaker is going to be Jean German. Uh, and uh, the language of that uh, lecture will uh, be French. So be prepared and <laughs> see you soon in November. And thank you again. It was a fascinating thank talk. You thank you, thank thank you, you for inviting us. And thank you for the discussion and for the very interesting questions, questions. also. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you and bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.